This is Reflection, and I'm your host, Ed Blonsky. We all reflect the things that are important in our lives, and the things that shine the brightest on our lives are the things that are reflected the brightest in our lives. On this podcast, I have conversations with people in whom God has made a difference and equipped them and called them to make a difference in other people's lives and in this world, and this is how they reflect God through their lives. My goal is that you're going to be encouraged to see how God can use you and how you can reflect him to change the lives of others in this world. The Reflection Podcast comes to you from St. Matthew Lutheran Church, and we are in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, and I'm on the pastoral staff here. Stay tuned after the conversation to find out how you can connect with St. Matthew. Thank you for joining me today. Now, let's see who's joining me in the pastor's office on today's episode of Reflection. In the pastor's office with me today is Jeff Meyer. And just uh, full disclosure, I've known Jeff for 40 years. So if we start talking in code, that's why. Uh, Because we, I think we, we've known each other so long you can finish our sentences. How do you know me for 40 years? I'm only 45 years old. Yeah. How did that happen, right? How did that happen? Unbelievable. So um, for my listeners and viewers, I'd like, Jeff, please introduce yourself. Who are you and where are you from? Jeff Meyer. I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, married to, uh, to a lovely lady named Amy. We have four daughters, uh, all who are out of the house, two married, um, five grandkids. I'm pastor at the church at Christ Memorial in Fitchburg, Wisconsin, which is Madison, basically. And I've been here since 1998. It's going to be 25 years this December. It's been a long time. And um, yeah, a lot, a lot of learnings through those years. I also am an author. Um, of two books and a consultant uh, use my gifts a lot with Oxano a company that helps churches get clear on their vision um, with vision clarity and uh, and then act from that vision operate from that vision and I also uh, have a business an LLC called Meyer plus which uh, has helped me launch my coaching practice called Jeff Meyer coaching oh so you're not busy at all <laughs> I appreciate you then taking time out of that because that's a lot of stuff that God has placed on you. And, well, you've got big shoulders, so I'm sure you can handle it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given it to you. So so what, 25 years, almost 25 years in one congregation, which is these days, that's quite an accomplishment. So that's awesome. God's blessings. And thanks for serving. I appreciate that. Um, so. so what are you doing these days at, at in that in those areas? Maybe drill down a little bit on, on one or two, a couple of those. Well, the church space um, for sure, leading out of the pandemic has been um, wildly interesting um, and a challenge and an opportunity, quite honestly, uh, to learn a whole lot of new things and reach a whole different population than we did before. Uh, we're coming out of that pretty well. I, I would say this year has been our best year in terms of uh, new people being reached and financially in probably six years. Um, yeah, the uh, we were in person or online only in worship for a full year wow. in Madison. Madison is a very, very... Um, took a very uh, conservative approach, and I'm not talking politically here. <laughs> If I'm talking politically, I'm saying they took a very liberal approach to um, the pandemic. And so we tried to be good neighbors and do what our what our county was asking us to do. Uh, we felt like that was the best opportunity for us to communicate um, love and compassion to our to our neighborhoods. That was an interesting journey, wasn't it? Ed, to- it absolutely was. Um, we were kind of the same boat. Uh, where I serve in Hawthorne Woods, um, we did go back to in-person outside over the summertime. And then we did, uh, um, it was a good, I don't think we were back in the building a good six months here, but we kind of, restrictions kind of um, were lifted a little bit sooner than in Madison here because uh, we're about 90 miles uh, south of you uh, across the state line, or as one of our friends, Al Bus, calls it the Cheddar Curtain. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting time, but I know that you were you guys were already set uh, to pivot to that. Um, you are, had already had an online presence going yes. into the pandemic. Yes. Um, the thing we didn't do uh, well with that pivot before was <clears throat> we had live streaming, but it was basically, you know, um, you can watch worship as it's happening. And <clears throat> what we really needed to do in the pivot was learn how to use <clears throat> the online presence to actually engage worshipers. So that's where we had our learning curve. Like, even today, I have a computer up front when I'm preaching, and I can see the stream, and I can see people's comments in Facebook that are still they're still worshiping online. And sometimes in the sermon, I'll actually ask questions and look for feedback, and people will give their answers, and then I'll share them with the the people who are in person as well. What so a great we want, we wanted people to be engaged in worship, not just watching worship. Yeah. Awesome. My voice. I'm having a little bit of a challenge with my voice this morning. So. Hey, I understand. I, I watched the skies turn orange as the sun came up this morning. Canada sending us their smoke again, looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand that completely. All right. So we, we've talked a little bit about uh, what you're doing in your, your church. Um, let's go over to uh, some of the other things that you're doing. Sure. Well, first of all, let me say I'm in a really interesting space in ministry in terms of this <clears throat> this local church because the kind of person I am with an entrepreneurial spirit and wanting to be involved in uh, helping other pastors and leaders, to be in a church that allows me to do that, I don't take for granted. So let me say that. I just have been very blessed that the church has seen that their pastor isn't just their pastor. They have seen, allowed me to use my gifts more broadly. So um, my consulting work with Oxano began 1990, no, 2006. 2006, we hired Oxano to help us with our vision. In the process, I got to be really good friends with the CEO, Jim Randall. <clears throat> And Jim took me aside. He was our consultant at that point and said, Jeff, you really have some skills here. Would you be interested in um, being a navigator with Oxana? And I said, well, sure, I'll check with my board. And the board was uh, happy to do that. They said, you can do that up to half time, Jeff. So I've worked with dozens of churches and um, um, pan-Lutheran uh, organizations uh, church organizations and it's been a real blessing not just to be out helping but to learn as I am out and bring that back to the congregation so we have actually we actually live out that entire process uh, every quarter we we just had a meeting yesterday with the board with the congregation coffee with the board and we shared our three-year goals uh, lined up with our ultimate vision of being household wells and our 90-day initiatives and had people engage with those things and it's just it's really cool to be able to be very intentional about where we're going why we're doing what we're doing have a congregation allow me uh, have those experiences and bring them back to the church um, so I've been doing that since 2006 Just finished up with a church in Houston this summer I got a text from I don't know if you know the name Al Daring, but he's at uh, Kingwood, Texas, and he just sent me a text last week. He had a picture of their their staff meeting agenda with his notes scribbled all over, and he goes, Jeff, we have never been so aligned and so excited about our future together. I praise God that we were able to work with you. And that just really wants my heart. I really do that's awesome. I know that you have helped our church um, with uh, sort of an offshoot from Oxano. The, the, there's the, the uh, God Dreams, and we're ready now um, at this point uh, to move ahead uh, and do, uh, because we had identified a couple things in there, and we found out some of the things that God has for us as a congregation and some of the things that he doesn't have for us that we thought he did. And 
and we kind of, um, God said, hey, wait a minute, you kind of, um, you're looking at the, I, I need you to look at this at a little bit different angle. And that's been awesome. And we're, we're going to be developing that over the next couple of months for our next uh, visioning process um, in come at the first of the year. So that's great. Now, out of, I mentioned God Dreams. That's, that's one of the um, resources that Oxano provides. Uh, but that kind of leads me into something that you're, it's very near and dear to your heart about dreams mm. and the dream experience accelerator and doing that kind of thing. So tell us a little bit about that. So in 2016, seven years ago, November, I began a six-month sabbatical from the local church. Um, that began in August. Before that, I walked into my boardroom and um, in my staff and said I was going to resign my call. And the church leaders uh, took some time to pray over that and came back and said, would you consider taking a sabbatical? I felt like my voice had reached its peak at the church and um, we'd had some challenging things happen at the church, people not really being aligned with vision and, and pushing in other directions. I have found in my ministry, I don't know if you've experienced this, but every seven years there seems to be a there seems to be another, uh, I wouldn't call it a fight, but a struggle for the vision. I don't know what it is about those seven years. It's very biblical, but I don't know if other guys have experienced that or not. But we have, and it was at that seven-year period, which is interesting because it's seven years right now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I took the six-month sabbatical. Um, I still did my Oxano work. I worked with a couple churches during those six months. It wasn't a true sabbatical. Um, but from the local church it was. And during that time, I journaled every day about leadership and personal struggle in leadership and following Jesus and what's that look like and what have I learned. And I shared the, those um, those journal posts that I, not publicly. I shared them with a few trusted friends, and they said, Jeff, you really uh, should consider publishing this. And I'm like, I... I do not want to publish a book. People don't need another book to read. They need to apply what they already know. So I fought that idea for a while, but then finally I turned that into my first book, um, Fear Not, Dream Big, and Execute. And because I didn't want to just write a book, um, I also started the Dream Accelerator, which launched my LLC. Dream Accelerators is trying to help people get clear an idea or a fuzzy dream that they have so that they will say, you know what, I have to pursue this. I cannot not go after this. It's so clear I can taste it. And then helping them actually take the steps, make the plan to achieve that dream. And um, we've been doing that since 2018. And we used to do it in-person workshops with follow-up coaching. Posted a couple of those in the Milwaukee area, Concordia, uh, hosted a couple, was ready to host the next one, and COVID shut the world down. So then I was like, okay, what do I do? So I had to pivot again, and um, we've been doing, uh, it's all virtual now, with weekly coaching, and it's a year-long process, and it's been amazing to watch people uh, pursue their dreams. I know that the pivot we talked a little bit, we've used that word a couple of times. That's so vital to be so flexible that you're going to do it because, you know, we, we talked a little bit about you and I are Lutheran pastors. And so basically that just gives us a language basically uh, to speak about. And, but one of the characteristics of lifelong Lutherans is we're not real good with change. We're comfortable with what things are and pivoting is not, not in our wheelhouse naturally, but the Holy Spirit, of course, can do amazing things when it comes to that. What What are some of the things that um, you you expected in doing that? And then what were some of the things that um, you had absolutely no idea this was going to be a part of this new type of ministry? Well, let me, let me uh, go back and kind of comment on what you just said. I think the how, the how needs to be the how needs to always be evaluated and held on loosely when we're talking about pursuing our dreams. 
because the how the how is going to change. It's going to have to change. Um, the why and the who remain consistent. So never. I mean, we think about the the pandemic and leading a church. What what were some of the hows that changed when the world shut down and people could no longer come to church? I mean, we had to change the way we communicated. We had to change the way that we distributed the sacrament. In some cases, some churches didn't do that. Right? They just said, "No, we're going to we're going to continue to do it the way we've always done it." Um, the way that we connect with people changed. Everything. The way we met as a staff changed. We had to learn new. Uh, many people had never used Zoom before. They had to learn how to use Zoom. Um, so the hows hold on loosely to the hows, but hold uh, hold on relentlessly to the why. Why you're doing it, and who you're doing it for. Who's your who? Um, because we tend to get wrapped up into methodology, in in strategy instead of the the reason why we're doing what we're doing. So with that, the thing I've been most surprised by is when when we did the in-person workshops, the follow-up coaching was sparsely attended. Just a couple people showed up regularly. I think you were one of them um, when you went through the, that Dream Accelerator experience. Um, these people that are in the virtual uh, Dream Accelerator right now, they have been, they just re up for a second year and they're there every single week at 4.30 on Wednesday afternoon. Um, it, it has been a true community. And they are encouraging each other. They are uh, connecting with each other offline. It's been, that's been the biggest surprise. The other biggest surprise for me is I thought content always ruled the day. Like my content in the Dream Accelerator, which is all available online, um, would be the most important thing I invest my time in. It's not. It's helpful, uh, but the most important thing is the community that is being formed between those Dream Accelerators who are involved in the program and the coaching that happens in a group setting where people ask questions. We give some answers. Sometimes we ask further questions to help them clarify. They give uh, encouragement to each other in the calls. That's that has been the most important. What um, that leads me to uh, to ask about myths. Um, when you find and implement a dream, are there myths involved that maybe bog us down? That this is what we believe about it, but that wasn't quite true yet. Man, there. Um there, there are myths before we ever begin that we tell ourselves. Most, most dreams die before they ever begin because people talk themselves out of it. They say things like, oh, someone else has already done this and they've done it so much better than me. They've done it so much better than I ever could, so what's the point? So they never get started, right? Um, a myth uh, like, I don't, know, I don't know how to do this. I I don't think I can accomplish it. Who am I to think that I could do this? Um, There's so many, I love the word myth, we use the word fears that people encounter when they start thinking about doing something they haven't done before. Um, and then once you're, once you're in it, once you're pursuing it, that doesn't go away. <laughs> I, I talk about fear being the one of the few renewable human resources we have at our disposal. And so many people feel like if they're afraid, they shouldn't do it. And now there are some things that we're afraid of, uh, you know, like if, a, if a, a child is about ready to jump into the swimming pool and doesn't know how to swim, probably a good idea to have a little bit of fear there, right, to keep them from jumping in the pool. But most of our fears are just the enemy's way of keeping us where we're at and not moving forward. So in our process, we have a, a process of helping people identify, name their fear, and then turn it and use it as fuel. Change their limiting beliefs, turn them into uh, 
statements that help them um, move forward and accomplish the dream that's in front of them. Um, the other myth, huge myth, is uh, I would call perfectionism. I talk about it in my podcast, the myth of perfectionism, that I can't move forward and pursue this until I get everything nailed down, I've got my plan in order, and everything is perfectly laid out. Well, COVID has taught us there's, there's nothing we can anticipate. There's always going to be something that comes up into the into the purview of our, our vision that's going to keep us uh, from moving forward. So it's not about perfection. It's about progress. It's about taking the next step. Those are a few myths. Incredible um, histor historical lesson, too, that, that there's a lot of military uh, people that talk about, you know, a plan only survives until you meet the enemy. <laughs> You know, until you get punched in the mouth, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get until you get, boom. <laughs> yeah, and then you got to pivot, and you've got. But if you've got the foundation, which we talk about as followers of Jesus, um, and 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 as pastors and people in the church, our foundation is the the the, the scriptures and our faith. But then, like you said, uh, I've done things. I've 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 met with people that do things. Well, I, I can't do that because this person's already doing it, right? Like you said, uh, and doing it a lot better. And it's like, but they're not you and they don't have your experiences and they don't have your uh, context with the people around you. And so maybe God is putting you there right, in your situation um, to do, yeah, what somebody else is doing somewhere. But, and, and and go ahead and do it. Don't be, I don't want to say don't be afraid. I don't think God tells us so much no. to not be afraid, but use that fear. I love that it's a renewable resource. If anything's going to get us going and there it is, man, we can tap into our fear all the time and it's moving it's forward fuel, anyway. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's fuel. Um, I mean, when you look at the scriptures, the, the number of times I've heard people say that there's, how, how many is it? How many days in a year? Three hundred fifty-two days in a year. There's three sixty-five, right? Yeah. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Somewhere I lose fourteen days in my year. Maybe that's vacation. I don't know. Um, yeah, but some some have said that the scriptures have a command: fear not, three hundred sixty-five times. I've never counted them. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but every time the Lord says "fear not," He always attaches a promise. Yep. Yeah. I, so I don't see fear not as a command as much as I see it as an invitation. Awesome. Yeah, so did did you come up with this or or do you have like a mentor that maybe kind of guided you in this? Uh, you know, it's a question of, you know, who who inspires you and who was a mentor to you? Well, I think that just came through years of wrestling with my own fear uh but i have so many mentors ed i mean i i you know ron goodsman was a dear mentor friend of mine i was privileged to do his funeral preach at his funeral um my father was a mentor i've got a, a couple friends that are business owners uh i'll keep their names out at this point but they have been tremendous mentors for me, and not just mentors, I think really dear friends where we get to share challenges and struggles together and learn together as we grow. I think there are other brothers I've had along the way, including you and um, others in our little group that's been together for, you say 40, but I, uh, um, <laughs> uh, that, you know, we we sharpen each other because we, spend time together and we're vulnerable with each other um so many people that have shaped who i am i think it the reason I, I i want my listeners and my viewers to hear that is because it is so important we don't do these things in a vacuum we don't do these things on our own well, there are another myth. there's another myth ed yeah that that these are things that and they change over time too i mean one of my mentors is actually about 10 years younger than me it's not necessarily someone that's older than me mm -hmm. uh, but there i i like i i don't know that i like that what they're doing i i do but 
I identify that they're doing something that's powerful that I kind of, we, we overlap with skill set that that could work for me as well, or God could use that in me as well. So it's a, I think it's just an important concept to find um, that we have mentors and men and that whole idea of someone guiding us that it, and it's more than just a, a mentor mentee relationship. Like you said, it's a friend. It's someone who knows us. Um, someone knows and, and still likes us anyway. That's uh, that's a key, uh, especially in my life. You know that that there are there are some some people that know me and still like me. Um, yeah, because right. They see something else in me as well that sometimes I don't always see in myself. So let me pivot just a little bit in the conversation. I think it's it's really a good conversation to have. Uh, but for the for people that um, they're just kind of looking for something. Uh, short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, the question is, I'm going to give you a, a, a billboard, and it and millions, if not billions, of people are going to be able to see it. What do you put on that billboard uh, for people that you would like people to know and to be inspired by? You are a co-creator. You're a co-creator with your creator. Now, there's probably a better way to say it. Um, I would say... What would you do if you're not afraid? What keeps you up at night? What would you like to do, but you're hesitant? Got a dream? Very cool. Very, very cool. So um, I'm not asking you to push your own books. I'll do that for you. Uh, but what... A, it, the, the, used to, the way this used to be asked is what's on your nightstand? What are you reading right now? But I, I think we need to bring it into the 21st century. What's at the top of your Kindle library? <laughs> you know, but, but what are some of the books uh, that you most likely would tell? I want, I want to give you something that you're going to give to somebody that might, that's inspired you and, and you think can inspire someone else. Oh, man. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, I've got one right here. Um, it's called The Last Lecture. Um, Lessons in Living by Randy Pausch. Not a, it is not a theological book. It's just a, a collection of short reads. But on the back cover it says, If you only had a short time to live, what would you do? It's sold over 8 million copies. Um, so I think it shows how many people actually, um, that it re resonates with, that they're thinking about their life um, a little bit differently. They're thinking about time is limited and what's really important. What's really, why am I here? You know, Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren has been one that has been wildly, I, I find it really so somewhat simplistic as a book, but man, people just, they love reading that book because I think there's something in there that touches our essence, and that is we're here. We're not just here to survive or, or uh, make it. We're here to, um, God's got us here for a purpose, if he didn't, he would have taken us right away after our baptism, right? Because we're not we're not supposed to we're not designed to be here other than to be on mission. Right? And what's our mission? And our mission is attached to our, our purpose. And I talk about this in my book. There's a general mission, but then there's also a specific mission for each of us. I'm I'm a different pastor. I approach things differently than you do. You approach things differently than than Kurt does. Um, Kurt approaches things differently, and he's got a different day-to-day -day operational work right now, being a, a professor at Concordia. Um, and so let's embrace the uniqueness of every human being and let them serve the way God has designed them to serve. Instead of, we, I, t I think we tend to in the church try to make everybody the same. And it's just not, Ephesians 2.10 says we are masterpieces. You know, we have unique thumbprints. God's created us 
differently and uniquely, and I want to help each person understand that and experience the joy of participating with God in who they're supposed to be. The whole dream thing isn't necessarily about going out and making sure you do something to please God or you do something to uh, become successful or any of that. It's about you being able to enjoy the process of letting God use you where you are with who you are. Well said. Um, you know, what? I can say, I, some, every time I hear a recording of our groups singing these days, I want to be Ed Blonsky and Kurt Taylor. I want to sing the bass parts. But we didn't need a third bass in our group, right? No, we did not. <laughs> That's a, a, just an illustration of embrace who you are, appreciate who God has made you to be, discover that, ha find someone that helps you identify that and supports you in that and believes in you and there's great freedom in that, and there's, it's the greatest adventure ever to be God's co-creator. I like that you, you do that because, and say that that way, the co-creator, um, is that God doesn't do this for us. It, he chooses to do the with us. And, and in Matthew 28, for those of you who know the Bible really well, that's kind of our, our marching orders from Jesus, uh, to go into all the world, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Um, but the church has called that uh, not the mission of the church, the great commission of the church, or co mission that we're in this together and yeah I, I i i i'm sympathizing with that idea that for many many years the christian church has tried to uh carbon copy each other that we're going to make us all the same um because we all have the same message we must be all the same and nothing could be more um devastating to the church and to our to our uh task to bring the gospel is to think that we all have to be the same you know I, I always wanted to be a, a tenor. I wanted to sing those high parts. You got the greatest harmonies and desk hands up there, and there's just no, no way. I have never been able to sing up that high. And well, but you can still sing your registered now, and I can't. So there you go. Well, there, I the way I used to. No, there is that, but you know, we pivot. We 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 just go with what we have. And so, hey, if I have to bring us down a couple steps, that's all right. I can do that. I can do that. Hey, um, I know this is going to be a hard one, but you kind of knew this question was coming. Is there something that you were thought I was going to ask you and I didn't? You know, is there a question I missed uh, that you and, and how would you have answered that? Hmm. Great, great interview question. I like to use that a lot when I'm interviewing potential uh, staff. Um, I would, I would say this, um, Jeff. What is the your greatest struggle? And right now, what is your greatest need? All right, it's kind of a vulnerable question. It is. Just set myself up for. Well, now you have to answer it. <laughs> but I think it's important for everybody, as you're trying to uh, collect these voices and let people speak about their lives. Sometimes I think we we look at somebody else's story and we think it's it's just been all uh, roses. It's all been great and with no struggle, and uh, it's just it's not helpful because then we feel like we're doing something wrong when we struggle. So the greatest struggle for me is my ongoing negative self-talk. Uh, part, of, part of why I do the Dream Accelerator is because I'm a fellow struggler in that process. Um, when I talk about fears and uh, limiting self-beliefs, I understand what those are in in my own life and what I've done to continue to be resilient and move forward anyway. 
Um, so I get it. I'm not just talking about this philosophically. Um, I'm a pra- I'm a practitioner when it comes to dream clarity and execution. And my greatest need right now, honestly, um, I I feel like. Uh, the, the need for me is just prayer for peace and rest. Um, I think because of the way I'm wired, I'm always thinking about the future and what needs to happen and the gaps that need to be filled and the, the process that we need to follow to, to achieve the, the dream, whether it's our church's vision to be household wells and to help each household recognize that calling and live that out. And I see the gaps, and I want to, I want to improve our processes and all that. So I'm, I have a hard time turning my brain off. And so, therefore, I don't sleep well. Um, and I just I want to rest, and I want to be at peace. And that doesn't mean I'm going to stop working hard. It just means I want to have peace in the middle of the pursuit. That's my greatest need. Well said. So get that rest then. Um, where can um, our, our viewers uh, find you online? So uh, jeffmeyercoaching.com is my website. That's the best place to go. Um, if you're looking for specifically for the books, you can go to Amazon directly. I do have a page on my website um, that uh, will link you there. Uh, my podcast is also available at jeffmeyercoaching.com. It's called Stop Doubting Your Dream. And, um, yeah, that's the best place. I'm also on Facebook, and they can always call me or email me if they'd like as well. I will put those in the show notes, too, those links to those uh, to your website and the podcast. I listen to the podcast quite a bit because um, I have about a 15, 20-minute drive. Uh, to and from home so I like to listen to that and it's just it's ways for me to not only uh, unplug my head from the day-to-day operations of being a pastor in a parish but also to get new ideas you know this is something that I didn't think about that and or this is something that I could use here uh, that God is kind of poking into my head uh, yeah think about this for a little bit you know and and i appreciate it too um so i want to thank you jeff for joining me today and and for our listeners you're you're doing great work i hope you can find that rest that you're looking for um and the peace it is given to you god has given you rest so um hang in there my friend and i appreciate you being with us buddy ed thank you for the opportunity hope you enjoyed today's reflection reflection is a weekly podcast produced by saint matthew lutheran church in hawthorne woods illinois you can connect with saint matthew by going to our website www.stmats.net that's www.stmatts.net and if you find yourself in the northwest suburbs of chicago we would love to see you at one of our services or events We are located in Hawthorne Woods, and we're about one hour northwest of downtown Chicago by car and just a half hour's drive from O'Hare Airport. You can also find us on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and on Instagram. Our podcast music was provided by thepodcasthost.com and Alitu, the podcast maker. Find your own free podcast music over at thepodcasthost.com slash free music. I'm Ed Blonsky. Thank you for joining me today. Please rate and review the show and share it with others. Join me again next time for more Reflection.